Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third week of the KITP program on gaseous halos, fundamentals of gaseous halos. I'm Cameron Hummels, uh, one of the organizers, and I will be the moderator slash organizer for this week's theme, which is the, which is what role do non-thermal components uh, play in defining the circumgalactic medium? I'm really excited um, about I mean, all of us are really excited, I think, about how things have gone so far. We're 25% we're of the way through this eight week long program. Um, of course, everyone has their own personal time constraints and will wax and wane in terms of the attention that they can give to this program. But so far, I think uh, we've had an overwhelming response from all of you in terms of your participation and enthusiasm. And, and it's, been, it's been pretty awesome. Um, I hope everyone had a restful weekend this this weekend to kind of recover. Uh, I was a little bit saturated by the end of the week in all that was going on, um, but saturated in a good way because there's so I feel like there's so many um, avenues and opportunities and ideas that that have come up in the past two weeks about projects and and collaborations. I hope you guys feel the same. Uh, so. Just to remind everyone, each week has a different topical theme. Uh, the first week we dealt with halo mass and its relation to galactic halos. The second week, last week, was on multiphase. This week, as I mentioned, is uh, non-thermal components, but we have various different themes that we will address over the course of these eight weeks. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, my co-organizers, Jess Work, Mark Voigt, and Ben Oppenheimer, I think uh, you guys have all done super well. And, and as I mentioned, each, each week we'll have a different theme, but we'll also have a different kind of organizers for that week. Um, next week is the Milky Way, and Ben Oppenheimer will be a moderator. So uh, if you have ideas specific to an individual week, you can always reach out to all of us or specifically the, the person who's, who's associated with that week. Okay, a few announcements before we get to the fun stuff, the science of the day. Um, this Friday, we will have a virtual trivia night. Um, it's at 4 p.m. Pacific, so I know that may not work for every time zone, but that's one of the, the challenges of this program and, and being a global event. Uh, but at 4 p.m. on Friday, I encourage everyone who's interested to, to connect to a Zoom that's linked in the Halo 21 socializing channel already. It is hosted by a professional trivia uh, host who does this sort of thing. All family members or, or partners or household members are welcome to join. You don't need to do anything in advance. Uh, we will organize into teams uh, when, we, when we arrive uh, by the, the host of this. Um, you're encouraged to bring your own beverage of choice and it should be super fun. So. Check it out. I know all the organizers are planning to be there, uh, so at least there will be four of us and hopefully many, many more. Um, okay, there's a, a quick survey that I encourage everyone to check out. It was um, sent to the Halo 21 general Slack channel. It should only take about five minutes of your time, but it gives us a lot of feedback, particularly um, we're trying to do this uh, each week to get feedback and, and, and improve upon this experiment, since this is our our, uh, our first time doing this in such a virtual manner and a and a KITP program of this of this type, and yeah, maybe it's I think it's going pretty well, but I'm biased. So uh, if you have suggestions, we're definitely trying to implement as many suggestions as we get. So go ahead and check that out. Hopefully, uh, sometime by midday today, you know, in the next few hours, midday Pacific, I guess. Okay, um, there is a Google document that you've probably seen, but in case you haven't, you can easily access it at the, at the short URL, bit.ly slash KITPCGM. It has all the information about the program, including uh, the, a detailed schedule of events for each day, including links to past uh, recorded lectures and slides and all sorts of, of stuff. There's um, we're working on getting transcripts from the videos linked as well. That was a suggestion that was brought up uh, recently. And links to the various outlets for getting on Zoom. Of course, you've been able to manage that because you're hearing my voice today. Uh, 
uh, get onto Slack, our YouTube page, and so on and so forth. Speaking of YouTube page, there's been a lot of activity in our new results YouTube page. Um, I think we have 16 videos now, eight, eight submitted last week. Um, these are new results that have been either published or put on the archive in the last year. So we're, we're making the cutoff like has to have been uh, submitted in the last since 2020 and and or or hasn't yet been submitted. We encourage audience members, you know, you to, if you have such a result or if you have a graduate student who has such a result or a postdoc, to write it, or not to write it up, you've already written it up, to, um, to make a video, uh, like a four minute long video kind of summarizing the relevant points for the community of the circumgalactic medium and gaseous halos. And there's even a video on how to make such a video. So, so check that out if you're not as familiar with video uh, creating tools. It's pretty easy. You can use like Keynote or PowerPoint or Zoom to do this sort of thing. And then you just submit the video in the Halo 21 New Results channel on Slack. We will grab it, we will upload it, and we will advertise it to the audience. So um, we had eight new submissions last week, uh, and they're, they're great. You know, I really enjoyed them, learned a, lunch, a, a, a lot. It, you know, there's, there's so much you can learn when someone's like just addressing you and showing like, this is a really cool, relevant plot, or here's the main theme, instead of sitting down with what could be a, a rather large uh, paper, a rather large and rather dense paper. So um, yeah, there's a, a good presentation on turbulence in the ICM by Raj Sikar Mohapatra. Um, there are two papers on cloud crushing uh, results, one from Vijit Kanjilal and Alankar Dutta, and then one from Jihoi Lee, uh, just, he just submitted that last night as the last one. Mark Voigt, um, one of our organizers, submitted a, a, a trifecta of various different results related to precipitation and gravity waves um, in, in, uh, in the halo. Then there's a very popular one on the saturation point of cosmic rays in the halo. You know, it has like 200 hits already and it was only posted in the last day or so. So I don't know, this is, it's, 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 it's really cool, um, cool result and, and taking YouTube by storm. And then finally, uh, Shmuel Bialy uh, posted a really interesting paper about the interstellar radiation field um, in, in disks. So I encourage people to check them out. Like I said, they're short and you can just sit down, as has been suggested, sit down over dinner and turn that, start the playlist and, and watch a few different videos on, on relevant papers to our field. Okay, another thing uh, that I wanted to announce is um, we have featured conversations. So conversation groups are essentially just different Slack channels uh, that are focused on different topics. So these are really run by you guys. If you uh, feel there's there's a an absence of a particular discussion that's going on and you really wanna initiate this, we encourage um, usually two people to start such a conversation group on a particular theme. And you feel free to reach out to us organizers to, to, uh, to make sure that that's, that's cool, but it should, I mean, really this is about you guys and starting new uh, discussions. So the two that we wanted to feature this week that are relevant to um, the topics that we're discussing and have a lot of activity recently are medicity in the circumgalactic medium and a project that's kind of spontaneously started, uh, uh, led in part by Zach Hafen and Jane Charlton. Um, and then one on turbulence, a, a discussion of turbulence and, and its effect in the CGM, led by Gwen Rudy and Drummond Fielding. So we will hear about that in a few minutes, um, but also check out, there's a magnetic fields channel and a Cosmic Rays channel that you should check out since those are relevant to non-thermal effects. Okay, so um, just to announce really quickly, the theme for today, or not the theme, the activities for today, we will have, as I mentioned, these featured conversations, we'll have like 10 to 15 minute introductions to these, these groups, these conversation groups, and then we'll take a, a brief break and then we'll start up for speed collaboration. So, um, Speed collaboration has gotten a lot of a lot of positive feedback from the community. I think from most of the people who've participated, 
We weren't able to do it last week because of the holiday on Monday, but we did it the first week. And that's a random pairing between you and another uh, member of the community who's on Zoom today. You, you have five minutes where uh, one minute each of you kind of introduces who you are and the research that you work on. And then the remainder of that five minute period, you're, you're looking for ways to collaborate. It, this doesn't obligate you to collaborate with, with, with this other person, but it's just an idea of kind of breaking ice about what you work on. And, and sometimes, you know, sometimes the, col the collaborative ideas that you guys have uh, with shared themes between your, your various research uh, components won't necessarily work out, but sometimes it will in dramatic fashion. So I encourage you to brainstorm new ideas that, that will relate with the science that, that both of you are interested in. Um, we have a couple of constraints. You have to be able to enable your video and your audio and be able to speak freely. You can't be like, I can't talk right now, because that's not very good for collaboration. Um, and right now we're, we're limiting the participants to people who will have their PhD sometime this year. Um, we are working on potentially having a junior version of this where other graduate students or even senior undergrads can participate with each other. But right now we've made the constraint uh, that in order to participate, you, you, need to, you need to be a little bit more advanced in, in your, in your uh, preparation. And we'll do five rounds of that and then kind of come back to the main group and, and debrief on what particular topics may have come up. Um, before we get started with that, uh, I'll just take you really quickly through the rest of the events this week. Um, we have a keynote uh, that's being given by Peng O oh from UC Santa Barbara tomorrow, and it'll be followed with a panel discussion uh, with experts in the field of non-thermal uh, processes. Blakesley Burkhart, Chad Bustard, Irina Butsky, and Evan Scanapieco will be speaking. I'm really excited about that. This Peng always gives like super stellar talks, so I encourage everybody to check that out tomorrow. On Wednesday, we will have tutorials, three tutorials given. Last week, we had four tutorials, and it seemed a little bit crushed. So this week, we'll have three. Uh, Suqing Ji is going to talk about cosmic rays and its impact on the, on the, on the CGM. Uh, Mateusz Ruskowski will talk about uh, AGN effects, uh, non-thermal effects on the circumgalactic medium. And then Yuan Li is also going to talk about observational measures of halo turbulence. So really good. I'm excited for that. Thursday, we will also have a keynote talk, this time by Ellen Zweibel, um, probably the most prominent astrophysicist, plasma physicist who works on cosmic rays in the world. So I'm super, super psyched for that. Um, and we will follow her, pres her keynote presentation with uh, a panel of Dr. Aaron Betcher, Professor Phil Hopkins, Yanfei Zhang, and Christoph Fromer, which should be great. Finally, Friday's events, uh, we will feature the featured conversations that we're going to hear from momentarily um, as updates of, of, of what's occurred in the group since there, and then um, have a structured discussion where these are topics that you guys can suggest and vote on uh, through our menti.com. I think it's worked pretty well in the past. We've gotten some positive feedback about it, but these are small scale discussions with five or six members in breakout rooms that then come back to the larger group to, to talk about the questions that you all will explicitly raise and vote on to, to say whether or not that's a, a good question to, to discuss. Um, just put together these awesome slides. She talked about them last week. It's just to make sure everybody is up to date on being able to use Slack effectively. Um, if you're in Slack, we encourage you to to uh, update your, your, your profile to have an appropriate uh, picture so people know how to recognize you, um, and uh, name pronunciation if that's relevant for you. You can join interesting channels simply by going to uh, the channel button, the three dots here, and then browse channels. Um, all the channels that start with Halo 21 are relevant for our program. There are like 30 of them now on various subtopics. Um, so feel free to join whichever ones are, are relevant. Um, in each channel, there's a little pin up in the upper left corner that you can click, and that will have pinned messages that might be like highlighted uh, long-term messages about the 
the discussion or slides that are posted or something like that. And finally, threads are super important. So you can thread different discussions and rather than responding in line in the, the bulk of the text from the, from, the, from the channel discussion, if you respond specifically in a thread uh, to, to someone's, someone's statement or comment, it can really help to self-organize these into relevant uh, self-contained sort of discussions and conversations. Okay, so getting back, well, first of all, do you guys have questions? I've been yapping here for like 15 minutes. Um, are, there, are there questions from the audience? Feel free to raise your hand if, if you have a question for myself or the other organizers. I'm not, I don't even know if I can see if people have questions. Let's see, oh, participants, okay. Okay, no questions. All right, then we'll get to, we'll get to the science. Um, okay, so let's move on to the featured conversations. Uh, we're gonna have, as I said, 10 to 15 minute presentations by uh, these two groups. We'll start off with um, the Metallicity group led by Zach Hafen and Jane Charlton. Do you guys want to, um, to unmute. Yep, can do. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you, Zach. Great. Um, and I can share my screen as soon as you're finished. Oh, yeah, sure. Stop. Okay. It's all cool. yours. Okay, so we have a few brief slides to help uh, accompany our conversation discussion. So this is a challenge um, or really kind of a experiment of sorts that came about spontaneously uh, close to the beginning of the workshop. And the overall stated goals of this challenge are in two parts, uh, plus a bunch of minor additional bonuses. And these are to determine what the new generation of observational modeling tools, many of which use this nice Bayesian technique for determining what the metallicity is or other general features of absorption sidelines, what these tools can constrain about metallicity when analyzing mock observations from simulations. Um, and so therefore we understand the input. The second part is to also understand the extent to which the results basically agree with one another and how consistent they are across the community. Now this is not necessarily trivial because uh, metallicity and generally the ionization state of, absorp of absorption line systems is notoriously difficult to model due to large ionization corrections. But people have been doing a lot of good work, so I'm optimistic. So this procedure has four parts. First, we choose a model circumlactic medium. Then from that circumlactic medium, we generate these blinded synthetic observations that will pass to the observational modelers. The observational modelers do their excellent work and we compare the results. All together, pretty straightforward. I'm gonna go through each of these steps to kind of try and explain the idea in a bit more detail. So first we choose a model CGM and there are a ton of excellent options to choose from. So here I've shown a bunch of different um, simulated CGMs or parts of simulated CGMs that could be potential input so on the left hand side, we have I these idealized simulations that focus on a pretty small area of the circumlactic medium. Uh, so experimental those by Drummond and Arena. And then we get to uh, simulated isolated galaxies. And then after that, cosmological simulations, some of which, like these, some of which have forced resolution in their halo. And then finally, um, from cosmological zoom simulations and from force resolution halos, we also have the larger scale overall cosmological simulations. So these are kind of the typical options you might expect. And uh, I've actually included about a simulation from uh, most of the theorists who have said that they want to at least participate in the conversation. So I'm not just reflecting some sort of arbitrary span. This is the actual span of potential data that we could access. Now, the next step is to produce blinded synthetic observations. And I'm going to just basically steal a plot or two from Cameron's Trident paper, which really explains this quite well. So this is where it gets to a little more detail. I'm going to go into a 
bit more detail for the um, beginning grad students. As you're well aware, the CGM is often best observed through absorption sight lines uh, that pass through the halo. And you can see just some cartoon version of that here. So beforehand, you have the quasar spectrum in the background, it passes through, and then you get absorption features afterwards. Now, the actual process of figuring out what happens can be thought of as follows. Here we have the sight lines that's passing through a simulated field. You've got the velocity of the field on here, and you have the density in H1 for each of these cells. And as you pass through, you get different um, column densities along the line of sight. And each piece of this also has a line of sight velocity. Um, now, once you take these line of sight velocities and put them in redshift space, or sorry, once you take these column density absorbers and then put them in redshift space and then shift them appropriately for Doppler shifting, you then get something like this blue distribution here. And this is where the absorption will actually be deposited along the line of sight. In temperature space, it will look something like this potentially. The next step after that is to apply Doppler broadening. So you have the absorbers themselves, you thermally, or sorry, Doppler broadening, uh, you thermally broaden them, and then you deposit each of their individual spectral features to make the final absorption line system. So this is how we do it computationally. And it also uh, describes a number of the physical processes that happen along the way that you need to be thinking of in this process. So this can be done for any of the simulations. Um, and the result can be hopefully realistic, but also one way or another interesting to think about because it still does provide a background data set to analyze. The next step is to perform observational modeling. And I'm gonna let Jane chime in here to talk a bit about why she uh, chose these particular enlightening plots. Yeah, so until recently, the general procedure was to measure a single H1 column density, perform some kind of an ionization correction and specify a metallicity of usually the strongest low ionization component. It was sort of an average metallicity over a whole system. Either that or to perform careful cloudy component by component modeling as our group has for about 20 years, but we have had always done it completely by hand and it would take six months or a year to look at a single system carefully. Um, and there were no error bars on the measurements. Um, recently, several groups have been doing a considerable considerably better job at constraining multi-phase parameters um, cloud by cloud. And uh, I'm sure that there are, there are some other folks besides these three, but these are the three papers that come to mind. Zahidi's paper, which um, showed that, in fact, in the same system, listed like vertically here, you see the same systems and you see the inferred metallicities from the models with their errors. And you see that within the same system, the metallicity varies considerably along the line of sight uh, from one velocity to another. Um, and there's phase structure involved as well. Um, here's a recent paper by Hazel Meyer um, et al. working with Todd Tripp and Neil Katz. Um, and this is not um, something I'm going to explain in detail, but the point is that um, it is possible to, in a rigorous way, compare um, mock column densities to um, the model or to the actual observations and to put in as many different parameters as necessary. This is a corner plot sort of showing the range of parameters that might be possible based upon the data and then um, in that way inferring properties. And here is uh, my own student Samir's uh, summary plot sort of showing um, by looking at absorption profiles and doing a Bayesian approach to match um, 
models to the actual observed profiles to infer what the metallicities are of the different phases. Um, an average metallicity is shown here on each of these plots, and then the metallicities of different phases of gas are shown, showing that the average is really just that, and that there are a lot of processes to be involved. And so I think that we really are ready now to um, do a reasonable job in a relatively efficient way, you know, to infer uh, phase structure. And more importantly, if we can't infer the metallicity accurately, this procedure will give us the error on the metallicity. And we will know that, okay, we can do the component on the left and we can constrain the component on the right very well, but the one in the middle, since we don't hit either edge of the hydrogen, maybe we can't constrain that one very well, but we would have error bars on that. And so um, maybe it's time to have a look at simulations and see how well we can do with those, understanding, of course, that they are generated under pretty different circumstances because the universe doesn't have little boxes in it of gas, um, and then suddenly there's another box right beside it with a different uh, property of gas. Nonetheless, it should be an interesting exercise. Great. Thank you for that summary. All right, and then this is the final step, and this is the one where there's the most interesting discussion. Uh, the rest provides a lot of valuable work in order to actually provide the basis for the discussion, but following that, we get to talk about some interesting questions. So, you know, the most obvious one is, can the observational monitors get medley all out of the provide mock data? Um, and then do the observation model metallicities match the simulated ones? Of course, keeping in mind some caveats. If there were certain methods that were more successful or more efficient than others, which ones were these and why? And of course, we care about efficiency, both computational and probably most, uh, most especially human uh, efficiency. So let's make sure that we're not spending too much time trying to do this. Um, and then we get to the more philosophical questions to some extent. So how much discriminative analysis is an issue? You know, do they agree within the uncertainties that are calculated? Can we calibrate the errors in terms of theoretically relevant quantities? For example, different metallicities will produce different cooling rates, which could have uh, implications for different mass inflow rates and therefore star, for star formation rates in galaxies. So hopefully we'll get to some interesting conversation within the next few weeks. So where are we now? Well, right now we're doing a first pass to get down the structure. We're doing this with uh, a single model CGM and a small set of observers. And then the second pass is when we'll be doing the experiment much more intentionally and uh, broadly. Now, you might ask, why metallicity? Well, metallicity is very commonly used, first of all. It's also physically meaningful in the sense that it is a decent tracer of the origin of the gas, at least to the extent of differentiating between fresh accretion from the IGM and winds from galaxies. There are many, many, many different variations that would be informative for this. So we could look at different derived quantities besides metallicities, for example, ion ratios. We could look at the levels of noise applied to the synthetic data, change the observing instruments, how much data we give. Uh, it might be possible that with enough data, we could find out an area where the model observations converge. The different types of synthetic data, instead of just giving column densities, which is all we're going to be doing for the very first pass, we'll be given full spectra. And of course, different model CGMs. So there's also now a call for anybody who would like to join us. So we particularly would welcome more observational modelers. Um, but we also have uh, room for more synthetic generators. And if you would like to provide input on either side of things, for example, if you're a theorist that would like to talk more about the observational modeling, uh, you're welcome to chime in there as well. 
or if you're an observer that would like to provide more insight on how we can make synthetic generations more reliable, please uh, join that side as well. So with that, I will uh, end the presentation. Excellent. Thank you guys very much. Um, I'm excited to see where everything goes over the course of uh, the course of this week. Right. Okay. Um, so for our second uh, featured conversation, I'd like to invite Gwen Rudy and Drummond Fielding to talk a bit about turbulence and its impact on the CGM. Oh, perfect. I'll let you guys take it away. Sorry, had to. Oh, no worries. I had to stop sharing in order to unmute myself. <laughs> okay. Are you guys seeing the slides? Yes. Perfect. And Drummond, are you here? I'm here. Perfect. All right. So um, uh, we started this channel over a week ago now to discuss um, the combination of observational tracers of potentially turbulence within the circumgalactic medium as well as um, some different theoretical ideas about, um, about uh, that topic. And in particular, um, I'm very excited about the crosstalk that can happen between simulators and observers, because I think there's a lot of um, space for progress there. So we just broke this up pretty simply into some sort of observational um, constraints that might exist for, for turbulence, and this is far from complete. Um, and then Drummond's going to motivate some of uh, the sort of angle of um, turbulence from theory. And then we have a set of questions that we are posing, which are already in the Slack channel pinned. So if you guys are interested in commenting on those, please go ahead and do so. Um, and you can just thread it in, in with the pinned, uh, pinned questions. All right, so to get started, how can we probe turbulence observationally? And I'm gonna mostly focus on line widths and absorber kinematics, um, which are two, two methods that I'm familiar with. Um, and so um, we know that by looking at absorption lines from um, different species that have uh, very different masses, but relatively similar ionization potentials, that we can actually disentangle uh, different types of broadening uh, within the circumgalactic medium. So these are examples from my own data from the Keck Baryonic Structure Survey at high redshift. But the idea is the same, uh, regardless of redshift, as long as you have enough spectral resolution to resolve these lines, uh, you can look for places where heavier ions are narrower um, than lighter ions, like this carbon line here. Those are examples of thermal broadening, because um, you expect uh, the width of the line to be inversely proportional to the square root of the uh, mass of the ion in the case of an isothermal gas. Um, Non-thermal broadening uh, shows the opposite uh, situation, where basically the widths of lines are relatively similar, independent of the mass of the ion. OK, so these are cases that I pulled out um, uh, from the data where I think you can see this by eye. But the question is, this non-thermal broadening, what is this actually telling us? Is this telling us about turbulence, or is it telling us about other things, like uh, we'll be discussing this week during non-thermal week? All right, um, what kind of constraints do we have on uh, the properties of absorbers as a function of redshift? So Xiaowen showed this uh, slide during the first keynote, and so I thought I'd bring it back. Um, and here she's showing examples um, from Fari Zahedi's really nice papers last year, um, over the last two years, um, showing that in the case of oxygen six, we actually see, they see relatively um, large line widths um, as a function of column and um, evidence um, that uh, non-thermal broadening really dominates um, at these sort of lower redshift massive halos. Um, if we go to high redshift, we see sort of the opposite case. We see a, a large amount of thermal broadening of lines and a little bit lower overall scale of of non-thermal broadening. Here I'm calling it turbulent velocities, but again, this is part of the discussion for the week. Um, we can see basically by rearranging these that in fact, uh, the internal cloud motion, so here when we're talking about absorber line widths, we're talking about the bulk motions of gas within a, an individual gaseous structure, um, as opposed to maybe the turbulence of the halo, which we'll get to potentially in a minute. Um, but here the idea is that these internal motions we know actually from these observations are largely dominated by, by subsonic um, internal motions within these clouds. Um, and so turbulent, if there is turbulence in these clouds, it has a relatively uh, small, small overall scale. 
Um, now we can contrast this perhaps with uh, the kinematics of the gas uh, moving through the halo perhaps. And um, that I think can give us some constraint, um, sort of like an upper limit on uh, the turbulence at least of that phase in within this halo. Um, and so again, pulling from Xiaowen's um, Xiaowen slides, we can see um, that overall the velocity profile of absorbers within the halo are either subvirial or typically virial at low redshifts. Um, so um, have an overall velocity scale that's either in proportion to the halo or perhaps significantly smaller. Um, while I think this contrasts to high redshift observations that show thousand kilometer per second range of, of uh, metal enriched outflows and unbound gas. So the gas moving at very high velocities now, I wouldn't necessarily say this represents the turbulence of the halo, but I think it, again, gives this sort of upper limit and also might represent some driving force for turbulence within the halo. Um, uh, lastly, we also might be able to look at optically thin emission from the circumgalactic medium, and that could tell us something about turbulence. And so uh, this is from a really nice paper from Erin Betcher, who hopefully will tell us more um, about this work um, uh, when she's on the panel, I think it was Thursday. Um, but anyway, this is um, showing that non-thermal broadening is very uh, critical in interpreting optical emission lines and extra, extra planar gas. Um, and I think this is sort of, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be seeing these kinds of observations a little bit more frequently from um, MUSE and KCWI results uh, that will come out uh, hopefully in the future. So that's sort of a really fast observational perspective on this. Um, and then uh, this is a simulation from Drummond and he's gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to him. Cool, so uh, Gwen, that was great. You kind of just covered everything. So I'll just add uh, a few tiny things while we look at this swirling, uh, swirling multi-phase medium here to highlight some points that I think would be interesting to discuss theoretically. Um, we've already started a lot of this discussion, but I'm, I'm particularly interested in how turbulence works in a multi-phase medium, you know, could be why I showed this last week. Um, but in, in particular, you know, and this touches really well with what Gwen was just talking on, there's sort of the, the turbulence of the hot phase, which you could think of as sort of the ambient or extrinsic turbulence. And then there's also the turbulence you know, there's sort of two other types of turbulence that I think are really important, both theoretically and observationally. One is the turbulence at the interface between the hot and the cold. This is this is sort of the mixing layer turbulence that I was talking about. And then, and this is of course intimately related, they're all intimately related, the turbulence within the cold clouds themselves. Okay, good, this finally stops so we can now like hold it here for one sec, Gwen. Yeah, so we have the big swirling motions then also the small sort of motions on the interface and then the, the motions within the clouds themselves. So I think these, how these manifest observationally is a really interesting question. And then also how these play into the overall survival and evolution of um, the different phases in the CGM is really important. And then from sticking with the theoretical perspective for another minute, I think there's a bunch of other really rich veins for us to discuss um, there's been great conversations already on turbulence in stratified media. Um, there's also, ah, good. Mark just asked a question. Drummond, is your turbulent box gravitationally stratified? No, this is not gravitationally stratified. Um, I, we, there's been some other examples posted already that are, I think there was a new results video as well that was about stratified turbulence. So I think that's something we should discuss. And then also how turbulence plays a role feeding on, you know, uh, building on what Mark just said uh, in precipitation models and how turbulence uh, might affect those. So I think there's a lot for us to to dig into both this week and, and in coming weeks. So um, I think we can move on now, Gwen, and we can ask the, the questions. Hmm. Here we go. All right, so we have um, three questions that we're seeding the chat with, if you will, but I think, uh, uh, you know, what Drummond just said is likely to prompt uh, additional additional comments, and we, we heard from uh, Mark already. Um, so uh, basically, the, the set of questions that we have here that are already in the Slack, um, we mentioned this observational non-thermal broadening that we, we capture in a few different ways. Um, so is this actually dominated by turbulence, or are other 
processes ongoing that we're going to talk more about this week, like cosmic rays and magnetic fields, more important? And does that change as a function of the type of galaxy we're looking at or the redshift of the galaxy that we're studying? Um, Dramani, you want to introduce two? Sure. So uh, we spend a lot of time analyzing, you know, the kinematics of these absorption line systems. And I think it would be good to really discuss exactly what those connect to physically, you know, line centroids, the, the spread of velocities, the width of the lines themselves. Um, and, and, you know, what is that, what is that telling us? Um, and in particular, you know, are the cold clouds uh, a good tracer of the background turbulence um, in the sense that they're perfectly entrained so their velocities perfectly follow the hot phase velocities or are they not perfectly entrained? And so then uh, we need to account for that when trying to interpret the, to make some statements about the hot phase turbulence using the cold phase observations. Perfect. Um, I think three, we, you pretty much already talked about um, when, the, yeah. when the video was up. Um, so there it's again, how turbulence operates in a multi-phase medium um, and talking a little bit about entraining gas, shredding it, et cetera. Um, so anyway, these are some questions that we thought would be interesting to discuss this week. But if you're interested in, in turbulence um, observations um, and or uh, theoretical discussions of this, please come join us on the Slack channel and uh, we'll look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Excellent. Thank you, guys. In particular, I like that that very last suggestion. What's the role of turbulence in um, in precipitation models? I think that's really intriguing. So, um, yeah, great. Thank, thank you both. Uh, thank both of the groups, uh, Zach and Jane and Gwen and Drummond. And I am eager to see what discussions and conversations take place over the course of this week. And we'll hear back again Friday morning um, on what progress has occurred. OK, so our uh, well, let's see. Let's give everybody like a five minute break. Um, before we get started with the speed collaboration, um, I'm just going to put up my slides again here. Where the heck are my slides? Oh, here they are. Oops. Um, yeah, so it is 8.47. Let's say at 8.55, people come back and we'll get started with the speed collaboration. Again, for speed collaboration, um, you need to be able to participate by having your video on and your, your audio on so and, and be able to talk freely wherever you are. And, um, and we want to uh, limit it to people who have uh, PhDs that they're obtaining this year or who have already obtained their PhDs. And yeah, we'll, I'll see you guys in like seven minutes. So get a coffee uh, or a glass of water and we'll be back. 